This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Which leads us to the third word that we're looking at today, which is the word of completion. John 19.30 says, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. What did Jesus mean? What was finished? Did it just mean, okay, I'm done, I'm dead? Is that what he was saying? Or was he referring to his sufferings? Or was he referring to his life's work? Certainly it was those things, but really even more than all of that. It was, you see, the end of an era. It was the end of an era. It was also the beginning of a new history. It was the end of an old history. It was the beginning of a new history. The Old Testament continues uh, or contains a, a long list of prophecies, all kinds of prophecies in the Old Testament, beginning with when man, oh, God told the serpent in the Garden of Eden that he would, in Genesis 3.15, says that he would put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and will strike your heel. That was a prophecy about what Jesus was going to do to Satan. It was this great conquest on the cross that was being enacted. In fact, what Jesus was doing was he was crushing the head of Satan and striking his heel. Jesus' cry that he that it is finished was proclaiming that he had victory over the evil one. The evil one no longer had the victory. He had victory over the evil one. The evil one was now condemned. And you say, well, if he's condemned, how come there's still evil in the world? Because he was condemned, the sentence has not been passed yet. It will be. Just read Revelation. We are in that time where the, where the condemnation happened at the cross, and at some point there will be the sentencing. And I think it's very, very close. And I also think Satan senses that it's very close. And I think one of the reasons we see what's going on in the world today is because Satan senses that. We are in absolute, total chaos, and we are in the end times, and you are part of it because God chose to put you here now at this point in history. And he put you here for his purposes and his plan. By the way, I was thinking on the way to, uh, to church this morning, I was thinking, isn't it interesting? I'd gotten a, uh, an email earlier from a, a guy who was really, really upset with, uh, it, it had to do with what was, what's been going on at Ferguson. And he was just really, really upset with, with, um, uh, how things had, had, have transacted. And he said, it's just like, like the government turned on us. And, and he said, I don't know what's happening. I don't know who to trust anymore and so forth and so on. And I thought to myself, you know, we live in a day and age where no, really no government can be trusted. I mean, let's face it. No political government can be trusted. No political government has been, we have not been able to trust any political government for the past I don't know, 20, 30 years? I mean, let's face it. Uh, you, you know, our government has essentially not been very honest and transparent. You know, we have, in fact, we have, even in our, gr in our group here, we have some veterans who are suffering from Agent Orange, suffering from the consequences of Agent Orange. Now, we know that that's what it was, and yet our government has never been forthright in saying, yeah, we need to accept responsibility for that. They've been dishonest. They've not been transparent. Now, if a government is not going to be transparent and honest with its people, then how are the people going to trust the government? That's any government. That's not just ours. That's any government in the world. And yet we have the greatest place to live in the world. We have the greatest nation on earth to live, in my opinion. It's not the government that makes it great. It's the people. And here's a key that you need to understand. Why did God put, and this is what I wrote to this young man, why did God put you here now at this place, at this point in history? If you're depending on your government to save you, you're in trouble. If you're depending on your culture to save you, you're in trouble. 
If you're depending on your family name to save you, you're in trouble. If you're depending on your job, your business to save you, you're in trouble. There is only one thing that you can depend on, and that is God, period. Because God is greater than all of that. Listen, if he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world, he that is in the world includes everything, everything that is in the world. And our God is greater than that. And your God put you at this point, at this place, in this nation, at this time in history, to accomplish His purpose and plan. What is He up to? And you have no excuse to blame everybody else for the problems in your life. Because God knew what He was doing, and He put you at this point, at this place, to represent Him and to stand in His grace and His honor in spite of all of that. Rise up. Your redemption draws nigh. You need to get busy. God's at work. You need to get in on it. And quit waiting for somebody else. And that's what was happening on the cross. Jesus was taking it all on by himself. Wasn't going to blame anybody else. Wasn't going to struggle with somebody else's attitude and approach. He had a job to do. A ministry to accomplish. And so do you. So do you. Your calling, your ministry exists because God has called you. Your calling, your ministry exists because God has called you. What are you going to do with that? And what are you going to do with the responsibility to fulfill that calling and that ministry because you've been given the privilege to live in a privileged nation even though things aren't perfect? What are you going to do with that to accomplish His will and His purpose? You got it pretty good compared to some people in Uganda and some people in Vietnam and some people in Venezuela and some people in a few other countries where things are pretty rough. You got it pretty good. Don't you see the responsibility that you've been given to stand up, rise above your circumstances and accomplish what God has called you to accomplish? Your ministry is greater than your suffering. Your ministry is greater than the consequences in your life. Your ministry is greater than the circumstances in the world. What do you do with that? And Jesus, as He was suffering on the cross, was not thinking about the political system. He was not thinking about how bad things are in the world. He was not thinking about about how people had wronged him. He was thinking about his calling, his ministry. And when he said, it is finished, I want you to notice something. He didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. It was a shout of victory over sin and death and hell. It is the same call that we are called to. We are called to stand up and represent the Lord Jesus Christ and represent God on this earth at this point and this time in history. In the same way, yes, he had a calling and a ministry that was greater than ours. He died for our sin. But you have a ministry and a calling also that God has imposed on you. What do you do with it? When Jesus said, it is finished, what he was saying is, here's what's finished. A, the dominant authority of Satan over the world. Yes, Satan is still acting, but he doesn't have the dominant authority because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You have greater authority than Satan does. Dig it? You have greater authority than Satan does. Use it! What else was finished? The work of the law was finished. No longer was the law in control. No longer was the law of the Old Testament in control. It was gone. The separation between God and man brought about by man's sin, which the law pointed out, was bridged by the cross. Now man could enter into the presence of God, forgiven and cleansed of his sin, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That had never happened before. They were living vicariously through the sacrifice of a lamb, hoping that that would be enough, hoping that that would work. They didn't know. They were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Now the Messiah was here hanging on the cross and man could enter into the presence of God forgiven, cleansed, and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ for the first time ever. Hebrews 4.16 says it this way. 
Let us then, that's you and me, let us, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. We live in a world of need. If we ever need to approach the throne of grace and mercy, we need it now to help in this time of need. And that's what you're called to. That's part of what God wants in and through your life. The third thing that was finished was the payment of sin. The payment of sin. First, what was finished was the dominant authority of Satan over the world. Secondly, was the work of the law. Now, also was finished the payment for sin. The Greek word for finished, when Jesus said it is finished, the Greek word is, uh, is a word that's used in business um, to indicate that a debt had been paid. In other words, it's something is stamped, it is completed, it is finished, it is fulfilled. It's like the message saying payment received when the stamp, when somebody stamps that across a bill. That's what Jesus was saying. It is paid for. This is what Jesus was proclaiming. It's paid. Man's account because of his sin has been settled. The debt is wiped out. Hebrews 10 verses 18 through 20. I love this. Where there is forgiveness of these sin, where there is forgiveness of these, there's no longer any offering for sin. Now stop right there. You know what that verse is saying? You don't have to go sacrifice a bull anymore. You don't have to go sacrifice the dove. What he was saying, Hebrews was written to the Jews. What he was saying, and I believe the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews, and what he was saying is, guys, you don't have to go do this anymore. Where there's forgiveness because of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, there's no longer any, there's no longer any offering for sin. There's no point to make any more offerings on the altar. No longer to do that anymore. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh. What He did on the cross paid the price. The payment for sin is settled. And then the fourth thing that was finished was this. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant that all types, promises, and prophecies of Scripture were fully accomplished in Him. All types, promises, and prophecies of Scripture were fully accomplished in Him. Which tells us, by the way, that we don't need any more prophets or prophecies of so-called prophets concerning the future. Now listen to what I'm saying. Some of you are going to get maybe a little upset with me, but I'm sorry, sort of. We don't need any more prophecies by so-called prophets concerning the future. Now, understand that I'm talking about prophecy as revealed in the Old Testament. Old Testament prophecy means this, foretelling. Old Testament prophecy refers to foretelling, telling us about something that would be coming in the future. In the New Testament, the word prophecy means of telling. It's a different word, of telling. It means telling about something. So if somebody has the gift of prophecy, which is talked about in the New Testament, it's talking about the gift of telling the Word, of revealing the Word. This is what the Word says. This is what it means. This is how it's applied. All prophecy in the Old Testament was given to reveal the authority and presence of Jesus Christ. All prophecy, all look, every prophecy that was given in the Old Testament had this single purpose, to reveal the authority and presence of God, really through the Messiah, um, and that was, that was the purpose of the prophecy. Even when it had prophecy that related to something that was about to happen immediately, it was about to show the greatness and power and authority of God. Anyone who comes along and claims to be a prophet of God, giving prophecy that supposedly reveals something that is not in the Bible, so this is to make something more clear. So I'm giving you prophecy because this isn't in the Bible. So, so I have to, you know, God told me to tell you this. Any prophet who comes along and gives you prophecy that reveals something that is not in the Bible is out of bounds, period. Because all, listen to this, all legitimate prophecy was about Jesus. 
all legitimate prophecy was about Jesus. Even Old Testament prophecy that referred to what was coming for Israel was in essence revealing this authority and presence of Messiah God and what he was up to. So when Jesus finished, when he completed the work of Messiah on the cross, there was no longer any need for more prophecy, for more foretelling, now we're, unless it's in the Word of God, which is why we have Revelation, which tells us about the end times, which is why we have some things that Jesus talked about that were coming in the future, things that would, that would happen in the end times. We have that, which is given to the Word, but we are no longer given prophets that tell us about something that is going to happen in the future that is not in the Word of God. We have New Testament prophets that of tell, proclaim what the Word of God says, and this is what the Word of God is teaching, and this is what you can expect. They give us an understanding of what the Word of God is saying about things that the Bible says about the future. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 9 and 10 say this, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the word perfect means completed, when the completed comes, the partial will pass away. When did the completed come? When it was finished. On the cross. Now, what the world needs is the type of prophecy that is of telling. That's what the world needs today. The world doesn't need any more foretelling. The world needs, we have, we know. All you have to do is read Revelation. You know what's coming. The world doesn't need any more foretelling. What the world needs is of telling. Proclaiming the redemptive, life-giving truth of Jesus Christ. That's what the world needs. But the Bible also says that there will be people who come along and proclaim to be prophets, even some who claim to be messiahs. And they will say this and this, and they'll tickle their ears, and, you know, oh, I want to hear this. Oh, they're saying this would happen, and it did, you know, and so forth and so on. And Jesus said that that would happen. We need to be cognizant of that. We need to stand for truth. Recognize we are not called to foretell anymore. We're called to of tell. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.